Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Barry Kostrinsky, and this is Artist Talks. Um, we have an exciting talk tonight. We've got Adrian Jenkins speaking. Uh, Adrian was recommended uh, by Wendy Liss, and I, I put it out to you. If you have somebody who you think would be interesting to give a talk to our group, go ahead and reach out to him. I just about always make it happen. Um, Adrian's topic is Carl Jung, uh, archetypes, art making, and creative consciousness. And as I joked earlier, that could be three talks in one. You know, we could just talk about archetypes. We could talk about art making and creative conscious. And just about all those topics have come up in our talks. So I thought it was perfect that Wendy recommended her. And of course, that's part of it. The thought comes up and it's uh, a thought that's in our mind. You find someone associated. And so I'm really excited and looking forward to this. I do want to say it's being taped. Um, this will be on the YouTube channel as our previous talks. Last week, we had one of those open talks, which uh, I describe as like when I had an art gallery and you uh, have an art opening for an artist, you always assume nobody's going to come and it's going to be a flop. And uh, it's sort of this fear element, uh, sort of like butterflies for an actor before they go on stage. And likewise, with that talk yesterday, there is no format. It's just us getting together and let's see, there was no laid out topics. But sure enough, the, the talk last week was brilliant. Ideas bounced around, we went deep, we stayed online, we also diverged a little. And I, I just wanna thank you all for sort of bringing it without packing it beforehand. And maybe that's part of what we do as a group when we come together, we support, we, not only we uh, explore, but we join our unconsciousness in a web, a sort of lightly connected web. And we did a great job of it. And I, I feel enriched from these talks. Even when we have a talk that we have a topic, it's never what you expect. And I think that's the beauty of these dialogues and probably all dialogues and hopefully all dialogues on the arts that, you know, it's like when you watch a movie, if you can anticipate what's going to happen next, that movie's not a great movie. But when the movie keeps you aware and open and things happen and take you by surprise, that's sort of pushing things deep and rich. I think Carl Jung, you know, he's one of the top fives or however, you know, I put him in my lineup, I'd have him hitting second. I'd probably have Einstein in the cleanup spot. And of course, Tesla would be batting third. But, you know, he's one of the great minds and he could bat third too. Carl Jung is a great mind of the 20th century and minds like that don't get forgotten. There's so much to unpack in Carl Jung. Um, uh, so much exciting thoughts and I'm gonna leave it to Adrienne to do and I'll have her do her intro. I just wanna mention Mary Zaran is gonna be speaking next week. March, uh, January 31st is still an open date. And then on the 7th, Olga Alexander recommended Yvonne Shore. I had a discussion with her, she'll be speaking. So if anybody would like to uh, recommend a talk, just reach out to me. As well, we have Mo Kelly here, our regular model on three screens. Um, and I, I like to think that while we have Mo here and we try and draw her, not only do we activate different parts of our brains, but we sort of relax and our creative unconsciousness comes alive because we're both drawing and listening and you know, if, you know, I was a math major and I did computer programming as well. And now it's very linear and point to point to point. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, on the other hand, when you try and like, you know, be circular or uh, go in a sine or a, curve, a cosine curve, you're doing something different. And I think with Mo here and us drawing her, you're freeing up some of the rigidity or rationalism and you're getting out of depth. And I find it works for me. Everyone has different drawing processes. I see uh, uh, Peg draws all the time. And I think it's a great thing that we offer. If anybody would like to contribute to Mo, you could reach out to me or to Mo directly if you have her info. I just want to thank her for always being here, always on time. And as you know, we had one talk where the model spoke. You know, we broke the fourth wall. She has a mouth, she has thoughts, and Mo is hysterical. Uh, she's doing Princess Leia tonight, as you can tell. So I'll leave you with that smile. Oh, staff, may, may the force be with you, Mo Kelly. And uh, 
as she sh as she turns her butt to me. And so, <laughs> I'll say, uh, welcome everybody. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. Thanks for being a part of our group. These talks are every Tuesday unless I go on vacation. I find it enriching. I hope you all do too. And uh, Adrian, let me uh, hand it over to you. Uh, Adrian has asked that we sort of hold questions to the end. Feel free if you got something burning, totally relevant, you want to jump in, do it. Of course, use the chat. I'm going to try and zip my mouth. That's not likely to happen, but I'm going to try. And so... Uh, Welcome, everybody. And Adrian, thank you for taking your time and preparing for us. Thank you, Barry. And uh, what a wonderful um, intro. Everything you said to me is about the creative process itself. The meanderings, the turnings, the unexpected. What a, what a beautiful um, way you, you've talked about what we all do here. Um, so I'm going to um, share screen. I have a, I have a presentation. <clears throat> Can everyone see this? Yes. I'll put it in presentation format. Okay. Uh, so thank you, Barry, so much for granting me this opportunity to present some of Jung's ideas on archetypes, art making, and creative consciousness. And I also want to send a shout out to Wendy Liss to thank her for introducing me to this group, which is just amazing um, from my experience thus far. And to those of you who express an interest in hearing more about Jung. Um, very briefly, I've been studying Jung for about 30 years and his work became more relevant to me personally through my own experience of painting. Um, I've worked in corporate marketing, which was where I, I did marketing research. And that's where my interest in psychology started back in college. I was an arts administrator for 20 years. I taught arts administration at Drexel University, did consulting with arts organizations. But for the last 10 years or so, I've been focusing on doing some consulting and uh, my own painting process and study, studying Jung more in depth. Uh, I've completed some certificate programs um, in Jungian education. So I'll give, I can give more details about my work um, at the end of the presentation if you're interested. But for now, I wanna take you on a visual and metaphorical journey through Jung's theories of archetypes and human development as it relates to the creative process. Uh, what he has to say is very valid for what we're doing. Many artists are familiar with the book, Man and His Symbols, uh, which was published in 1964, a few years after Jung's death in 1961. The book is a compilation of essays edited by Jung that were intended to generate public interest in his work. Jung has stated that it was not so much neuroses or psychosis that interested him, but the healing properties of numinous experience. Jung believed from his own personal experience of working with archetypes that self-understanding of psychic contents would lead to a full, productive, and more creative life. On the right, on the far right, is an image from Jung's Red Book, published well after his death in 2010. This purely personal work was kept hidden from everyone except his closest confidants. And with its publication, we could see Jung himself as an artist. This extensive work in the form of an illuminated manuscript created over many years of his life is a revelation of Jung's personal in-depth work with archetypal images. Using his dreams and visions as source material, Jung engaged in a psychic drama, a very personal psychic drama, through images employing his own method of active imagination and art making to unfold the many layered aspects of himself. This personal practice informed his philosophy of depth psychology and all of his work with his patients. Um, his black books also were published much later in 2020, and they were more written journals um, that he had kept that he used 
as the source material for his um, illustrations that became the Red Book. All of this, a fascinating exploration of the creative mind and how it works with psychic material. Jung said, the artist is not a person endowed with free will who seeks his own ends, but one who allows art to realize its purposes through him. The image on the left is a stone carving by Jung that he crafted at his retreats, home and studio in Bollingen near Lake Zurich in Switzerland. It is based on an ancient image from the Inca in Peru as a symbol of opposites and the four directions enclosed in a cosmic circle. This basic mandala structure informs all of Jung's philosophy, seeing us as humans centered and surrounded by the psychic realm, positioned in the still point where ceaseless movements of psyche are naturally oriented toward wholeness and human growth and development. Jung's depth psychology, also called analytical psychology, expands on Freud's interest in dreams and the personal subconscious. Jung differs from Freud in valuing the deeper layers of the unconscious mind that are collective rather than personal. This is what he called the archetypal realm at the deepest layers of psyche. From a Jungian perspective, our conscious awareness is limited to a small range of experience like the tip of this iceberg. Consciousness sits upon a subconscious layer of developmental contents that are personal and was Freud's inter primary interest. And this rests on a deeper vast stratum of universal archetypal material. Jung asserts that this collective unconscious is a powerful driver of human attitudes and behavior that can be seen in art, myth, and stories spanning time and cultures that are imbued with a similar meaning. He asserts that each individual is connected to this universal archetypal core of shared human experience. So he believed that our personal psychology was connected to this universal psychology and that the universal holds the healing potential to help us with our, per, our own personal wounding. The archetypal realm of the collective unconscious is expressed primarily through images. The image is central to Jung's philosophy of working with these unconscious archetypal patterns that flow through us and our creative work whether we recognize them or not. In his view, the moving images of Psyche's archetypal realm both inform and reflect our human nature, serving as a repository of collective memory. And they are a wellspring of creative inspiration that we as artists can draw from. Here we see a progression of children's drawings from the bottom at the very bottom here, this is bottom and then going up to the top, that begins with basic lines and circles that you see down here and gradually becomes more human-like as children grow and are educated. Note the cross, note the cross and the circle and the star shapes at the base level as they are recurring motifs in art and in, in uh, they serve as a foundation for Jung psychology. Um, Edward Edinger, who was a student of Jung's in his book, Ego and Archetype writes that symbolically speaking, the human psyche was originally round, whole, complete in a state of oneness and self-sufficiency that is equivalent to deity itself. Jung says that every civilized human being, whatever his conscious development, is still an archaic man at the deeper levels of his psyche. And he was also suggesting that we are intimately connected today with the ancestors, with all humans 
from the past. And I'm gonna scroll through a few images here. Um, you'll see recurring images. Here's a uh, Paleolithic cave art, an ancient Mesopotamian seal. And this is a contemporary uh, artist work, ceramic artist, Edo Winograd. Um, I saw her work in 2019 here in, in the Philadelphia area. And you can see the recurring themes and the similar dynamics in these works through time. Jung writes that the creative process, so far as we are able to follow it at all, consists in the unconscious activation of an archetypal image and elaborating and shaping the image into the finished work. By giving it shape, the artist translates it into the language of the present and so makes it possible for us to find our way back to the deepest springs of life. And of course, humans have done this for millennia. And now I'm going to take us uh, through some images that relate to how we access the depths of the unconscious psyche, which is something humans have been doing for a very long time. We see here a guardian gateway um, that marks, that stones or stone carvings that were marking um, entryways into temples. Typically, um, these human animal motifs would, pre would, would present and they would flank the entrances to caves and temples as places of deep inner work known as initiatory experience. These thresholds symbolically suggest an entryway or portal to de deep inner psychological experience that is found in the archeological layers of psyche. This is a goddess temple in Malta with an entrance marked by similar lion uh, stone formation. Note how the goddess temple is shaped like a female body. The entry is marked at the vulva, the entrance into the female body and into the uterine area. And another gateway marks the entry into the breast area. And the initiates would enter and do ceremony in these spaces and then exit through the same gateway. This significant inward journey is often depicted as a winding labyrinth carved into temple floors and also in the underground recesses of Gothic chapels, including the one at Chartres Cathedral in France. Here we see architect Mimi Lobel's floor plans for a contemporary goddess temple that she drew in the 1970s and note that the, um, there's a winding path and there's also the central focus or the eye, um, which is the, is the center where the transformation would take place for the, initiate, for the initiate. Lucy Lepard writes in her seminal book, Overlay from 1983, that everywhere the labyrinth symbolizes initiation and birth, death and rebirth the return to the center or womb. And Jung viewed this metaphorically as psychological processes that took us, that take us into the deep unconscious psyche. On the left, we see the ancient goddess on her throne flanked by lions and owls, um, typically double figures with the goddess, with the seated goddess, um, later known in Mesopotamia as Anana, and then in Greece and Anatolia as Cybele. On the right is British artist Tracy Emin, standing between two lioness statues that she purchased for herself. And in an interview, she said, I just had to have them. They spoke to me of something eternal. In images, the goddess is never alone. She is surrounded by animals, plants, a male consort, and sometimes holds a child or baby animals. Inanna descended seven steps as she slowly disrobed to enter the dark cavern space of her twin shadow sister, Ereshkigal. Here in the underworld where she was hung on a meat hook 
for days and later miraculously rejuvenated. Sounds a little bit like the creative process sometimes <laughs> um, where you feel stuck and then suddenly something breaks through, um, some sort of psychic content breaks through. On the left, we have a watercolor by Louise Bourgeois. Uh, in the middle is the entrance to a cavern that's on my, my property. And on the right is the Sheila Nagig, uh, which is a, um, an ancient, one of the earliest ancient feminine rel relics in the, in the UK area. And these um, images represent the feminine in her fullness as the progenitor of life with its cycles of birth, growth, decay, and regeneration, also related to the four directions. And these processes and cycles are what Jung believed were akin to psychological process, as well as biological and natural processes. The unconscious is typically associated with the archetypal feminine as a watery, nourishing space that is the womb we are birthed from and also the tomb to which we return when we die. Jung viewed the feminine as a psychological container space for initiation or what he called the process of individuation, which entails a descent into the underworld and followed by an ascent, which is more of the hero myth that we hear a lot more about. Even Freud suggested that there is an oceanic feeling that occurs through psychic processes. In Jung's view, one must be psychologically equipped for a deep dive into the waters of the archetypal unconscious, for he recognized there are treasures as well as dangers here. Alice in Wonderland or Dorothy winding her way to Oz are familiar forays into this vast archetypal well. Typically a mentor or guide shows the initiate a way or a path through the meandering and wandering in these realms. And now we're gonna shift a little focus here. This is a 1937 painting by Salvador Dali titled Metamorphosis of Narcissus. Freud's Interpretation of Dreams was published in 1900, followed by his essays on the Oedipal Complex and Narcissism in 1912. These were his interpretations of psychological conditions based on Greek and Roman mythology. These essays divined early psychoanalytic theory and affirmed Freud as the father of psychoanalysis. Jung was his student at the time, but after Freud dismissed Jung's archetypal perspectives as being unscientific, the two parted ways. Jung left psychoan psychoanalysis for a time as he reckoned with his own, what he calls, confrontation with the unconscious, which he describes in his autobiography, Memories, Dreams, Reflections in chapter four, which I highly recommend by the way, for anyone who's interested in Jung. This period of years where he was isolated from his colleagues marked an intensive self-study uh, program that he devised for himself using his own methods to explore the archetypal motifs he was seeing in his patients and that were emerging in his own dreams. So while Jung was off experimenting with his theories, it was Freud who actually influenced many artists and poets of the early 20th century, sparking the surrealist movement that Dali is associated with. Dali was a huge fan of Freud and had read his essay on narcissism and was, it seems, maybe even a bit obsessed with the myth. He, um, he did this painting, which is actually very small. It looks like it might be monumental, but it's, it's only um, maybe 20 by 28 inches. Um, he also wrote a poem that was published uh, in Paris uh, about Narcissus um, and called his wife Gala, My Narcissus. Um, 
I'm, I'm going to go through a few slides here that relate to a, uh, a thesis I completed for my archetypal pattern certification that is based on this myth. And I use Dali's paintings and other artist images to reference the notion presented by uh, Renaissance philosopher Leon Alberti Battista in his treatise on painting written in 1436, where he declared that Narcissus was the first painter or the first self-reflective artist. Note the double image of Narcissus. The two images were of his body on the left, golden light. And on the right, we have a hand that I see as Echo. Um, Echo is with Narcissus through the whole story in all of its poem, um, the metamorphosis, which is what the myth is, is basically drawn from. I wanna note a few things about this painting as we go forward and look at other images. Um, in addition to, the, to the, the foreground with the double image and the reflections on the water, you'll note in the center area of the painting here, there's a group of people that I'm referring to as the social group. And then over here on the right is Narcissus, almost as if a marble statue. And this is the way that Ovid describes him in the myth. Um, and he's situated squarely in the middle of this chessboard. And then in the foreground here, we have this wild dog eating carrion. There's a, you know, there's a dead animal there. Um, so just kind of keep this in mind as we're going through the next several slides that are by um, other artists who are also referencing the myth. This is an early image from Pompeii where Echo and Narcissus adorn the walls of family homes as objects of beauty. This is an early woodcut of Narcissus looking at his image in the water with what appears to be some conflict or even indifference um, going on around him. This is probably one of the more familiar paintings of Narcissus uh, from the year 1600. And this painting reminds me of a biblical saying from the Psalms, I'll just read it, it's very brief. He makes me lie down in green pastures he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And that's from Psalms 23. Still waters whose clarity reflects new insight and understanding or redemption for one's sins. This is a painting by Nicholas Poussin from 1630, where Echo appears here, there's Narcissus here, and here's Echo. She appears as a ghost or an apparition, invisible and hidden, which is exactly as Ovid describes her. She's not a person. She's not a real person. In this painting by symbolist painter Gustave Moreau from 1867, we see him imagining that Narcissus is lifting Echo from the waters of the unconscious perhaps carrying her into conscious awareness. We have a more romantic notion of the characters here in Victorian painter John William Waterhouse's Echo and Narcissus from 1903. And this is Leighton House and Museum in Kensington, UK, the former Victorian home and studio of British painter and sculptor, Lord Frederick Leighton, who built this shrine to Narcissus. And to see how the influence of the myth and other artists' work is still influencing artists today, on the left is a part of a much larger painting. This is one panel of a larger painting, um, The Myths of Men, uh, done by Ruth Wolf who is a Philadelphia artist. She had a show at, at the studio building where I work here in um, Philadelphia area. And on the right, we have Pablo Bronstein, uh, a still from one of his performances called Carousel from 2019. Um, he has explored the myth extensively through performance. 
And here we have Yayoi Kusama, her Narcissus Garden, which um, basically just had its own resurrection a few years ago in 2021. On the right, it was shown at the New York Botanical Garden. And if anyone um, got to see it, I it was amazing. Um, her, her, her whole show was amazing. And, and seeing this Narcissus Garden out in that open meadow on the water with those reflecting balls was just beautiful. Um, on the left, we see her in 1965, I believe, um, 66. She was outside the gates of the Venice Biennial. She was not accepted in the Biennial and she staged a protest outside. She decided to show her work outside even though they would not put it inside. Um, she had a fascination with Narcissus from an early age. Um, and many of her uh, other works that you may be familiar with, her uh, infinity mirror rooms are all about reflection and based on the myth and a very early vision she had as a child of being in a field with flowers. So to relate this to some of Jung's uh, work and theories, Jung said, by consciousness, I understand the relation of psychic contents to the ego insofar as this relation is perceived as such by the ego. So working with the archetypal realm requires that the ego is open and, and um, willing to work with these contents. And on the left, we see what's called the ego self axis, which is um, a concept that was further developed by a Jungian analyst who, who studied with Jung. His name was Eric Neumann. Um, I highly recommend reading his book, Art and the Creative Unconscious, uh, for those of you who may be interested in exploring some of the concepts I'm discussing here today further. What we see here and what, what kind of intrigued me about this as I was working on my thesis is that this image to me, especially figure four, was an aerial view of Narcissus looking at the image in the water, which would be the archetypal self. So, you know, we typically equate Narcissus with being obsessed with his own image, you know, with looking in the mirror at himself. But when you read Ovid's poem, you see that he was actually confused about what the image was initially. He actually thought he was dialoguing with a beloved love, like a lover. And he tried to grasp the lover. And when the lover could not grasp him back, in fact, when the image started to disappear as the water was moving, Narcissus cried. He felt rejected. Um, you know, earlier in the story, he's rejecting others, but he felt the sense of rejection himself. And Ovid, who's writing the poem, steps in at this point in his own poem as the narrator, which leads me to suspect that he's writing about himself and perhaps his own creative process when he says to Narcissus, don't be a fool, Narcissus. You're not looking at another person. You're looking at yourself. So this is a moment of insight. Um, and, you know, Jung himself would say that surface appearances may not be real, that we need to reflect upon or dig deeper into the archetypal recesses of the psyche. And the self is the central archetype in Jungian psychology. And it's, it's symbolic of a divine image of humans being reflections of the creator. Um, so I'm gonna move on to another image. This is a photo that I took on my television when I was watching the Grammys in 2022 and Justin Bieber was doing a performance of two of his songs. One was called Lonely and the other one was called Holy. And I could not help but see references to the Narcissus story. Um, if you note the, the cross up here and then on the floor 
is a radial, it's like a six pointed star or flower. And here's Justin Bieber in the center and there's mirrors all around him. And you can see him reflected in different positions, right? It looks like it's a different person actually um, around him. Um, so the, the, the floor, the, the star image with these six points, it reminds me of um, the six petaled flower uh, it had six white petals and a golden center, the Narcissus flower that, that Narcissus becomes when he dies, or um, as Ovid describes him, when he dissolves, he kind of melts. Um, and that can be akin to the ego dissolving and opening to other aspects of itself that it hasn't seen before. Um, Justin Bieber's performance was very powerful and I'm just gonna read a few lyrics from each song. From the song Lonely, everybody knows my name now, but something about it still feels strange. Like looking in a mirror, trying to steady yourself and seeing somebody else. And then from his song Holy, he says, I don't do well with the drama. And no, I can't stand it being fake. No, 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 I don't believe in Nirvana, but the way that we love in the night gave me life. Baby, I can't explain. Through the creative process, we work on the cross, so to speak, connecting the four functions of Jung's typology the vertical axis in this diagram on the left here, this vertical axis of sensation and intuition is what Jung called perceptive reality. And the horizontal axis of thinking and feeling, Jung called rational reality. A self with a capital S from Jung totally is, is totally symbolized by this mandala, which is one of um, Jung's on the right here, with, a, with its center point and its cross, where we connect the dots between unconscious and conscious, psyche and matter, as an embodied experience through our art making. This is where imagination and technical skill of manipulating materials come together, psyche with technique these dual aspects of the creative process with which we are naturally engaged, but perhaps not always consciously aware of how this deeper psychic work is being activated just by the fact that we are in this process of working with what Jung viewed as opposites of psyche and matter. And just, so that we can see how Jung viewed the unconscious and the conscious. His vision was very expansive. He saw um, that there, oops, sorry. He saw that the ego, that the persona was really uh, the, what we reflect to the outer world as many of you are probably familiar with. The ego and the self are here, they're separate, but they need to work together the ego self axis is what eventually connects the two. Um, I, I really, I'm gonna go back a few here because I wanted to say that in this diagram, this is sort of a developmental model uh, moving from left to right of the ego and the archetypal self. Um, the ego can get lost in the unconscious, which is, um, you know, can be a problem. You, you actually need an ego to function in the world. And as we develop consciously, and Eric Neumann, who, did, who um, came up with this model, wrote a whole book called The History and Origins of Consciousness. He shows how human evolution over time moves from the left to the right, so that the ego is becoming more witness to the archetypal and relating to it through this ego self-axis. Um, and then we have the shadow. So in the, in the collective unconscious, the shadow is actually interesting because it's, it's both personal and collective. 
Um, and the shadow is not always um, something horrible. What it is, is repressed. Some things, it's something that the ego doesn't want to see about itself. And it can just as well be something traumatic or something that, you know, painful that we don't want to see, as well as a potential that we are not living. And so shadow basically means something that's not seen by the ego. If you think about um, how light works and the ego might be, if we're standing and lights coming from behind us, the ego is the thing that blocks the light and we see the shadow, but the light is there. The light is everywhere. It's just blocked. We're, we're just not able to see it. The anima and the animus are at our Jung's um, symbols for the masculine and the feminine, and I'm going to talk about in a minute, that are at the very deepest recesses of the psyche. And on the right here, we see how, how life unfolds. It's very natural and, and Jung viewed psychic processes as being equally natural in their unfolding. MC Richards, who is a Potter poet, philosopher, in her book published in 1962 uh, called Centering says, centering is a verb. It is an ongoing process. I have said that centering as an archetype comes through the potter's wheel and the spinning clay taking shape. But archetypes are beings of special subtlety and paradox. So centering is not a model, but a way of balancing, a spiritual resource in times of conflict and imagination. It seems in certain lights to be an alchemical vessel, a retort, which bears an integration of purposes, an integration of levels of consciousness. It can be called to like a divine ear. For Jung, archetypes are a priori. They are primordial. They've been here probably um, since the beginning of time. And they work as field properties. So they, they're in the world working and they're working through us as field properties, which are, are multi-dimensional. Um, quantum physics was just um, becoming a science that was starting to look at this. And Jung was very interested in physics and had um, a few good friends who were physicists, including Wolfgang Pauli. Um, what physicists were discovering and what the, the psychologists were discovering in the early 20th century has repercussions for individual consciousness, human biology, our collective consciousness, and our evolution as a species. In the center, we have a painting by Picasso. As he acknowledged, our anonymous ancestors brought a more than modern skillfulness to their work, creating not illustrated plates of animal anatomy but entire imaginary worlds as they adorned sanctuaries where the dramas of human and animal life were played out. The magic of the image functioned as an effective expression of the needs of early societies throughout the world. Aboriginal artistic traditions like from the left suggest that rock engravings, paintings and sculptures are responses to social and symbolic tensions highly meaningful visual inventions that play a part in integrating individuals into the community. Enacted in dream time rituals, the image created by the community express collective symbols evoking a numinous experience of the archetypal realm where opposites paradoxically coexist. Numinous moments where complementarity and mutuality as sustaining and co-creating patterns and relations are disclosed as an observable reality that challenges our current paradigm of radical separation. And on the right here, we see a painting by um, feminist artist Joan Semmel. Uh, and this to me is like literally reaching out to touch that shadow or something unfamiliar or other to us that Jung would equate with the unconscious, 
the psychic material. It's it we feel that it's something unfamiliar, but it's actually um, a part of who we are. Jung says therein lies the social significance of art. It is constantly at work educating the spirit of the age, conjuring up the forms in which the age is more lacking. The unsatisfied yearning of the artist reaches back to the primordial image in the unconscious, which is best fitted to compensate the inadequacy and one-sidedness of the present. The artist seizes on this image and in raising it from deepest unconsciousness, he brings it into relation with conscious values, thereby transforming it until it can be accepted by the minds of his or her contemporaries according to their powers. Archaeologists in the 1960s suggested that Paleolithic cave paintings, when, when viewed uh, structurally across cultures, were organized as iconographic units reflecting a cosmogenic perception of the universe founded on a male-female dualism that we associate with creation myths. Creation mythologies drive artistic creation as alchemical processes where conscious and unconscious, masculine and feminine, whatever opposites you choose, meet through encounter and are mutually transformed. This is what Jung called the transcendent function. It arises from a union of conscious and unconscious contents. And on the left, we see an alchemical image of this process. And Jung was very much into alchemy and we see the opposites of the solar and the lunar. Um, and on the right, we have a painting by Pollock called Male and Female, um, where he was uniting the two on this canvas. Jung refers to these dual aspects as logos and eros and describes our current collective psychological and creative moment when he states, the concept of eros could be expressed in modern terms as psychic relatedness and that of logos as objective interest. It is the function of eros to unite what logos has sundered. The yin-yang symbol expresses Jung's idea of the quaternity as a basic psychological structure where the opposites include the other. Every woman has a masculine aspect he called animus and every man a female aspect he called anima. There's an innate relatedness where life is the balance of holding on and letting go from Rumi. And these are ceaseless, ever-changing movements that happen all the time. Andre Breton in his Surrealist Manifesto of 1924 wrote, the image is a pure creation of the mind. It cannot be born from a comparison, but from two realities, more or less distant, brought together. The more the relation between the two realities is distant and accurate, the stronger the image will be. And Jung would say the more tension there would be, the more it will possess emotional power and poetic reality. And uh, we have in the background here a work by Hilma Aklint um, and Ake Font, who uh, wrote about her work in a catalog um, from the 1980s called The Spiritual and Art Abstract Painting, says, in Ofklin's words, all her forms represent the knowledge of duality from which a rich creative strength emerged. She was constantly surprised by the results of her unconscious activities and was unable to explain them. For her, color expressed feeling as a form of unconscious latent knowledge. Her way of working allowed for imperfection using forms, colors, shapes, not as she had been taught but as perceived true to her imagination. New forms and color harmonies naturally surfaced in the work. Donald Cuspit, art critic, writing in his book, The End of Art, published in 2004. 
In a genuine evolutionary dialectic, the opposites organically inform each other, forming a unified whole that is greater than the sum of both. Growing together on common ground, they synergistically interrelate, creating an unexpected revolution in consciousness. Each signifies an old consciousness of self and world, but their dynamic integration revolutionizes our consciousness of both. A new perspective on the life world emerges from their synthesis, achieved by hard emotional and cognitive work, affording uncommon insights into what has hitherto seemed commonplace. A world of self that seems stale, finished, and familiar suddenly seems fresh, full of possibilities, and unfamiliar. Even as the old sense of the world and self is brought into question, both acquire a new sense of purpose, and with that, a new value. You know, I, I, I do want to cut in for a second and say, sure. yeah, you know, um, as an artist, yeah. I'm, I'm hearing you say a lot of things that I can't phrase that I know my work is about. And I, I put this out to artists that sometimes there's a reason you want to quote a uh, philosophy or a psychologist because somehow, or, or read them as well, because somehow, you know, we know what we do, we know how to create, but sometimes there's a better expression than we are able to put. And tonight, you're throwing a lot of great expressions that I think explain to us what we do better than we can explain it ourselves. And so I, I've, I've always liked when uh, uh, a movie or something throws me a great quote for a set. <laughs> and there's an argument to be made, you know, for artist statements, you know, go to a great quote. Sometimes it's great for a reason and it's, it's super relevant. So I just want to say I'm hearing and often, and often it becomes validation for me because, you know, I do, I paint, I then look and I say, oh, that's me combining this. And then it ends there. But then when I hear what I'm hearing, I'm like, you know, these guys are thinking it too. And they're saying it on a much richer level. So if it's just for validation and knowing, you know, you're part of a larger group that's yeah. making these thoughts or it's sort of, uh, you can fold it into your artist statement. You can actually look at it for relevance. And, you know, it almost becomes like a working partner. These, uh, yes. you know, Donald Cuspet is not a voice from the dead or the past, but certainly Carl Jung is a very live voice. From yeah, and what, I, what I'm finding interesting is I do more research into the creative process itself is that artists are talking in these Jungian terms. Like they're talking about working with the opposites. They're talking about some of the things that Jung is saying, but we don't associate it. You know, they're saying the same thing in slightly different ways and it's all pointing back to Jung's theories from, from what I can see. Um, and, and, this, and this quote from, from Donald Cuspit to me, it's almost as if he's talking about what we experience as artists as a creative breakthrough. Like we're, you know, he talks about like something old and familiar, then if there's something new that comes through that's fresh and full of possibilities, it's unfamiliar. So it's exciting, but it's also scary and all that, you know, that we feel. Um, so yeah, I, I, I do take comfort in reading what different artists say and reading Jung and, and uh, lots of other people, so. Are there any other comments? I have just a few more slides and we can talk. Do you want me to just wrap it up? I would like to say that I've got to watch this again. This was so loaded with, <laughs> I could never say myself, but like, oh, oh, that that's what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's where this shit's coming from. So no, thank you. I got to watch again and, and uh, yeah, it's a lot to lot to process. I got goosebumps there for a minute. Yeah, thank, thank you. God you're thank God you're recording it, Barry. I was thinking yeah. the same thing because I want to like I want to watch this a couple of times, listen to this a couple of times. Okay, great. That's my two cents. Before I also have some thoughts. <laughs> okay. How How about if I just finish? I have like three slides. Well, I'll just finish up here. And I have been trying to give an overview of Young. Uh, 
as concisely as possible, but there's a lot, there's a lot, you know, there's a lot with Jung. So, um, yeah, we'll do the uh, 12 hour talk next. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so a great book that I also highly recommend that discusses the history of art and all the conflicts around it that happen in the external world and also internally with artists um, is the book, uh, The Transformative Vision by Jose Arguelles. And he says, the problem of art is inseparable from the problem of consciousness, of which uh, Jung would definitely agree. Um, and he does, he does a great summary here, I think, of Jung, uh, when he says, with Jung, with Jung's notion of archetypes, a cosmic vision is placed within the genetic psychological structure of the organism. The wisdom of our contemporary ancients, the shamans and the yogis, is an organic wisdom intrinsic to our own nature. The perennial philosophy, the means of gaining that wisdom, is no different than the development of our own consciousness for which purpose the force of history is both a repressive burden and a challenge. To begin again is to embark on the archaic path, the point of which is to become more fully, and those are my words, more fully ourselves. The vision of what we are to become is already within us, awaiting the proper discipline through which it might be appropriately expressed so Jungian, so much about art making. And this is, a, this is a quote from one of my teachers here in Philadelphia, his name is Tim Hawksworth. And he says, poets talk about making a temple of the inner ear for sound to echo down into the psyche. Painters have to make a temple of the belly and withstand how marks, paint and imagery go into our bodies. Often social, social and political dialogue is designed to separate us from the experience of living in our bodies and painting and poetry are ways to close that gap. I'm gonna end here with, this is a photo of Jung's uh, home and studio in Bollingen and may he inspire all of us to do our important work what is the work? I'm going to end here with famous New York New Yorker Patty Smith, that wonderful bard for the ages. Um, she says, "The true poet stands alone. I've survived because I want to live. Even in our troubled world, even with all the greed and stupidity and terrible things that we're all facing, I want to be alive." I want to breathe. I want to do my work. So I will end with that. Um, and I will I will stop screen sharing. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. I, I've got to echo. David's thought and Babs, and I think everybody here feels like it, 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 you threw a lot. We like that. We like that. And you, you threw a lot of great, rich thoughts at us. You know, I'm reminded of when I, when I was a math major, one page in a math text was at least two days of study. It was such rich stuff to go from one line to the next to understand the theorem. And this was very much like that. These were deep, rich thoughts. And of course, as artists, we're, our minds are racing when we hear one. We're, we're connecting to ourselves and to our work and to our thoughts. So yes, this is on tape. And I was gonna say the same thing, David. Uh, I've got to rewatch this one. Um, so thank you, Adrian. I'll open it up to questions. I do want to read what Michael Krasowitz wrote. Um, yeah. He had to leave a little early. He put out, he has to run, unfortunately. Thank you, Adrian, for your talk. And he mentions, he thinks, though, that the idea of duality is too limited sometimes. I think it's a patriarchal Western definition. I think it is more like a matrix of infinite components that are bouncing off each other. But that's just a theory. And I think it points to what I said to you earlier, Adrian, that, uh, you know, a good theory doesn't supplant an old theory. It incorporates. And we are the Bible and a lot of our thinking is dualistic. There's a lot of binary thinking going on. And things are not black and white, yes or no. And I think Michael is pointing out 
that there's, you know, there's a lot more than uh, the feminine and the masculine, the yin and the lang, yang. We, we like to like superficially make it very bite-sized, you know, peanut butter and jelly, a very simple sandwich. But, you know, my point is it, it can be richer and deeper and certainly life. I mean, let's face it, we're monkeys. We're monkey cousins of monkeys. And we're trying to explain, you know, we're trying to explain more than the universe here. We're trying to explain the self. And I, I think the Narcissus story, where you look at that image of yourself in a pond and you try and touch it, that is such a deep metaphor that it always moves away, that you can't know the self, that it's a reflection. It's not you. It is you. You know, and, and you think of, uh, you know, I, I have fish in fish tanks. And when a rasser looks at himself and he sees a reflection, he's like in fight mode. And it's really fascinating what goes on. And they say to calm down some fish so they're not aggressive to others. You put a mirror in the tank. So they start like looking at themselves and wanting to fight. And some of the analogies to us come around. I, I don't know how I got so far off tangent, but I do like my fish. And uh, I guess the point is it is a rich, there is a rich underbelly. And I think that's what Young is getting at. And whenever you try and get at it, it just keeps iterating like chaos theory and gets richer and deeper. And you, you may not... We, I don't think we become complete. I don't think we get an answer. And I think all the best, all the best things are the questions and the paths of questions. And you certainly spurned a lot of questions. There were a lot of rich thoughts in here tonight. Let me open it up. Uh, Lily White says, thank you, Adrian. Anybody can, I just, can I just respond to that comment about the duality? I actually, Jung actually uh, would agree with everything you just said about how that's pretty simplistic. And that's basically like, if you're talking about the archetypal, the shadow, and then the anima animus, these are like where we are as human beings. This is how we have tended to think. But as you get deeper and deeper, it is, it does open up. It's way more multidimensional. There are dimensions of experience that are way beyond the duality. And Jung did see that. He just couldn't, he, he touched on it, but he couldn't really go very far with that because he felt that, you know, most of us are still dealing in that dualistic, just getting people into the archetypal, you know, he felt was a challenge, um, but it is multidimensional. What we see of it might be dualistic and then it might expand from there. It's our, it's the way we're perceiving the world that's dualistic, not psyche itself. Yeah, I think that's how he would explain it. So I just wanted to respond to the question since it came up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank I think um, with Michael's comment, I think that's, I can't tell you how many times I've heard his comment out of different people's mouths. So I do think that, um, especially in today's world with, with, you know, all the stuff, that's happening. Um, I think it's important to really say that, yes, there is the, the duality thing is the basic way of starting out to explain, but it does expand into a multifaceted diamond mm -hmm. that you just can't go into. And um, I think if people were to read one book by Jung, they should read psychology and alchemy, because to me, that gives an overview of all of his uh, theories. And then people, if they're interested, they can take it from there. Um, so that, that's what I think. And I did think of the, uh, the man's name in Philadelphia is James Hollis. Oh, James. Is he from Philly? He, yes. he lives in the main know line. That. He has come here to speak. I did not know he was from here. I don't think he lives here now. Okay. Yes, he's very and well known. I think that there, I think there is a real danger with this whole thing about the duality. Um, but to me, it's interesting because the Chinese came up with the same concept, the same basic concept of yin and yang, and then they then they expanded it through their five element theory, the I Ching and all of that really shows you 
how that can expand in a simple way, I think, and, and become the multifaceted thing. Yes. And and Jung, I think, was looking at it as, as a quaternity, the yin yang. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, has, it really was. Right? Yeah. So that that in its the yin yang symbol itself has four different elements in it. It's showing how there's interaction. It's not a simple dualistic. There, you know, there's four points in that diagram or four areas. Um and I, I think the the dualistic thing um probably has its you know its most uh easily accessible um what should i say uh imagery in uh, when you're analyzing the dream mm. which you you brought in about the anima animus um and and things like that so um i think that's very important because people just take it like you know, my mother, my father, Literal, right? Literally, he said that to me, and she said yes. So they don't, they don't understand. It's like a, an imagery thing. It's not, it's not, you know, your boss, uh, be being so uh, sexually inappropriate with you at the office. It's not that. I mean, that's part. You know what I mean? Right. But that's how people see everything. They see everything like materialistically. Right. All, don't see all it thing beyond, are, I think, especially in America. Yes. The dreams have personal and symbolic elements, all mished, mashed together. That's why they're hard to understand. It's, it's all in there. It doesn't make sense at a certain level. Um, also, you, the, also <laughs> the, the symbols in your dreams it's important to know your feeling towards the symbol. So uh, when I was once looking at stuff and Sir Clo has a great book, C-I-R-C-L-O-T on symbols. And he, he can tell you what all cultures think about symbols, but how you feel when you see a bear, that really expresses the symbol. So the bear can be aggressive, it could be dancing. There are all different things. And so, Yes, yeah, somehow they're iconic symbols, but they play many different roles. And uh, obviously dream interpretation is quite complicated. Sort of a mix of the last Chinese food you ate and your inner personality. <laughs> well, this may not have a, a specific relationship to uh, dualities, uh, but the when I'm thinking of when I'm working and I'm picking out materials because I have all these different materials I work with, I'm always thinking of the materials in the aspect of the yin and the yang and the attraction and the repulsion of each of the materials. And then through the manipulation of the materials, can I flip the script? on what is the attraction and the repulsion. There's this, I'm constantly picking materials that are soft and hard. All of those opposite things are going into my choices when I'm looking at them. And I I love to try and put these materials together that you're thinking like, why is she putting those two materials together? And it's simply two materials. And now I've conjured up this third or fourth or fifth or sixth thing. I don't know if that plays into any of the Carl Jung thought. My thought was simply coming from the, the yin yang. That's how I began. I don't, so it's, it's just interesting to think constantly that way. And it's an inherent way that I work. It was one of the things that originally attracted me to working with hair because of all the different symbols and meanings and the attraction repulsion of hair depending on the context mm -hmm. and i wanted you to be either attracted or repulsed or at least have some vi visceral response to it yeah I yeah that, young what young that would be like what young calls the tension of the opposites and the attraction and the re and the repelling which is mag magnetism 
right? Magnetic theory is duality. Like it actually does exist scientifically. Yeah. Um, and so, and, and that yin yang and the whole duality is an archetypal symbol of that magnetic attraction and re repelling, which is what the whole story of Echo and Narcissus and all of Ovid's Metamorphosis, which is talking about these different characters who are constantly transforming themselves through their interactions, exactly what you're talking about that the interactions, they're mixing it up and they're all, both sides are changing as a result of the changes in the attraction and the repelling. And so when I, when I read Ovid and I'm pretty new to him, you know, as I, I did this for my thesis a few years ago, I see that he is talking about the creative process, you know, and what you're talking about. This is what the creative process is. We are working with these different things and shape-shifting and changing things up and trying new things and then you try one thing and something new happens and you respond to it right or yes. you reject it or you love it and you go more with it and go deeper with it this is all very archetypal very Jungian um mm -hmm. you know what you're saying is rings true I think you know, on a very practical level to bring it to colors, it's just working with complementary colors and you're pushing, you're getting that extreme or likewise black and white, or it could be a vertical line with a curved line. It was so much interesting in this talk. I am not going to attempt to summarize it at all. <laughs> um, I, I could summarize maybe two minutes of it, but I, I will diverge and I'll say one thing that I, you know, I want to thank Mo Kelly, of course, for modeling for us. And I don't know if it's relevant, but I think everything is relevant to this talk. So somehow this will make sense. I notice, and you, you hit on it recent, just now when you were speaking, Adrian, when I start to draw, and I've noticed this whenever I go to life drawing, I draw a certain way for X amount of minutes, you know, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and then something happens. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, and I like my early drawings. I like them very much. But it's almost like when I turn the page and I flip to another drawing, I get a freedom that I don't get from continuing the first drawing. I also, I loosen up my line and I just do a summary. So if the angle gets smaller, I exaggerate it more, you know, for the arm or if the shoulder is up. And all of a sudden, I do a different drawing that I feel is very powerful. And I, my point I'm trying to make is that You've got to enter the game. And yes. once you enter the game, the game changes. And mm -hmm. I recently came across that there are two types of chaos. There's chaos that's sort of an ordered randomness. And then there's chaos that's influenced by the events, like weather, the stock market. And I think drawing is like that. So we do stuff. And then the doing changes the whole picture. And so we can't really put our finger on it. We can't really see that reflection of ourselves because we're looking at it and that's a layering of the self. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was talking to my uh, ex-brother-in-law about uh, DNA and he mentioned one of the big discoveries in the last you know, 20 years and probably for a hundred years is that around our DNA, there's another chemical biological element that actually is how it expresses. And it's sort of like, my analogy would be, it's the self accentuating the DNA and make it activate or not. And it's, again, it's this principle that we're not written in stone. Our stories are changing and we are influencing them. We have predispositions. So when I draw a certain way, you know, I'm coming at doing my thing, but if we keep ourselves open or if we just work, the work will influence us to go somewhere else. So Babs, you work with the hair, you have this thought, it could be really wide, but after a while, the work influences the work. And as artists, we like to follow that trail. And that's, uh, that's, that's like a great ride, it really is. And it's, it's an open ride. There's no correct turn. You know, there are many options and we get to be free. And I think freedom is like the big issue of being human. We get to be free as artists to make our choices, you know, whether it's our color, our form, our material, how the work evolves, is it pre-planned? These are all our freedoms. And I think if you look at the political level, 
not to bring it up, but to bring it down to something uh, real, freedom is a central issue um, in everything. And so I think with young, is our shadow self controlling us? Is it the things we don't accept? And as you pointed out, Adrian, the things we don't accept could be really good things. Like, you know, you could, I saw something about this recently, you could want to be with other people, but for some reason you don't accept that. Well, if you put that in your shadow, it's going to be a subconscious element that's peeking through and a disruptor, so to, so to speak. But I think, I think we want to follow our trail and sort of free everything along the way. And, you know, to, to bring it back to Zen in a way is we want to bring it back to being totally open, to not being full, to not knowing. I mean, imagine you go into college and you say, yes, I want to not know anything, so I'm open. You know, you get an F on every paper, right? We're, we're always focused in, to labeling objects, drawing trees that look like trees, right? That's the old school for the last so many years, you know, way to do things. But the, there is another path to accepting what we don't know and seeing where that takes us. When I, uh, Thomas, when I look at your photos, they are beautiful. They take me to a world beyond this world, which is the real world. And I think that's our goal as artists to sort of make palpable the unknowable. And I think Jung is very much saying, you know, and Freud, we're not aware of what the actors are within ourselves, let alone our society. And let's try and see it to release it. That's my attempt at a summary. This was great. A Adrian. Beautiful, you. beautiful summary, Barry. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Adrian, thank you so much. That was brilliant. It'll be up on the YouTube in a few days and I'll share it. Uh, and thank thanks, you. Wendy. Thanks, Wendy, for thinking of that. Yes, thank you, Wendy. And I think that's, that's I think, the best yeah. point here that you're making. Um, when I'm glad. I'm glad everyone enjoyed it. I knew it would be a lot like packing it in, but it just felt really relevant because so many artists kept referring to these things throughout their talks. And I'd been taking a class with Adrian for this past year, and um, it just felt right and good. So I'm glad if everyone enjoyed it, but definitely a revisit to all the information, especially if we're drawing at the same time and listening, there's just a lot there, yeah. And, and that's, that's our group as a collective consciousness at best. You know, you're bringing, Wendy, you're bringing elements to the pie. You know, we're all bringing something in. David, your comments, you know, it's, uh, I, I think, uh, being in the woods as I always get it wrong if it's Emerson or Thoreau I think that was the wrong way to isolate I think we need to group up a sort of to a super consciousness or a group consciousness you know sort of like a couple you ever notice when one old man starts a sentence and he looks at the wife he goes that place we went to and she finishes I think our neural network can connect to someone we're close with. And most of you guys have never met in person. I think we connect very well. And when we connect like this, we hive up in the best way possible. And we also, as much as it's an exploration of the self, we lose ourself. We become a part of something bigger than the self. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's been very helpful to me. Thank me you. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, everybody. This was Thank great. You. Thank you. Know this was great. Thank you so much. Yeah, really. Thank you so much. Uh, right. I got to watch this again. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Mo. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. Bye. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>